The Darwin Innovation Hub, creating pathways to the future. Morning everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Please familiarise yourself with the Zoom platform. Everyone will be on mute today for the purpose of the presentation running smoothly. However, if you have any questions, please use the chat function to type in your questions and we will aim to answer them during the webinar. And for those that we can't get to, we will answer offline. Today we are joined by the Managing Director of Outback Safety, Martin Hill. Martin delivers high quality and practical work health and safety consulting to businesses around the Northern Territory, providing progressive and innovative advisory to help protect your business and plan for better management. The last few months have been extraordinary. Businesses have had to think quick and react fast in order to implement the daily changes imposed upon us by state and federal governments. It hasn't been an easy one, it has been heartbreaking, and it has broken down many systems, plans, and businesses themselves. But now, the Territory and the rest of Australia are gearing up to reopen. It will be a new normal, and whilst we must continue running our businesses to the best way that they originally were, we must also prepare for the changes that we face in the way that we operate. So without far further ado, I will pass over to Martin. Thanks, Emma. Um, <clears throat> now, in regards to um, business continuity and COVID management and everything that's been going on, a lot of uh, questions have been asked of me of exactly what is uh, business continuity, which has kind of led to this presentation. Um, there has been some belief that business continuity is only really based around um, COVID, but that's um, not really it. So what we'll do is we'll actually go into our presentation here. Um, so basically, I suppose first a bit of um, background about myself. Um, I've been in the work health safety quality environment industry now for over 19 years. Um, I've worked on several different industries. Um, I suppose the best way to put it is um, I worked in every industry bar space exploration, however that's just around the corner. Um, now I do have um, several qualifications to um, help me in understanding what business continuity and how to manage all these top areas are. As based, I've got a master's degree in human factors and safety management systems as well as, well as multiple um, postgraduate qualifications. But not only that, I've actually got very strong hands on ground and the fact that I'm also a diesel fitter by trade. So, probably the best words of wisdom I've ever come across regarding to what we're living in at the moment. It's actually from a fellow by the name of Keith Cunningham. Uh, he's an American entrepreneur and he's probably one of the world's most foremost authorities on business mastery. So basically his statement, which I, I fully agree is, when the environment radically changes and you're confronted with the moments of uncertainty and danger, clinging to the old right way might seem like a good idea, but can frequently be deadly. So basically what we should be looking at is what we've done in the past, may not necessarily be what is for the future for us. So first of all, when we look at business continuity, it's also about managing our risks. So first of all, what is risk? A lot of people inherently believe that risk is bad. Now, that's an unfounded truth. In fact, actually, the um, International Australian Standard um, on Risk Management actually categorises risk as it can either be good or bad, positive or negative. It also runs at different aspects within your organisation. So whether it could be on health and safety, it could be on financial, it could be on human resources, but also it operates at many different levels. So it could be at the strategic level, it could be at the operational level. And it's usually expressed as a consequence of an event and the likelihood of an occurrence. So let's just give you an understanding of exactly what risk really is. But when we actually now want to go into it, we actually want to have a look at what business continuity is. So basically when we look at business continuity is we're going to look at whether, you know, when you're running a, a business of anything, things don't always go to right, um, always go to plan. You gotta prepare your, your business for any type of event that potentially could happen. So these events could be anything. 
So it's all about making sure that you're establishing a, a decent and practical risk management process to prevent those interruptions um, on your services and getting back to full capacity as quickly as possible. So when we look at that, at the moment, we're going through the coronavirus and stepping back into it, is how are you going to get back into the norm? There are several businesses out there that have adapted um, and achieved even better. So first of all, we'll have a look at some of our aspects of the business, which you really should be looking at. So first of all, we have some of the issues which could be regarding to the economic or financial. So these are events that potentially could impact against yourselves, whether it's internal or external. Global financial events. We had the GFC earlier um, in 2007 and 8. Okay. We might have interest rates increase. In fact, actually, when you look at Australia, we've had interest rate decreases. We're at the, one of the lowest points ever for quite a while. You might have cash flow shortages. Now, I'm quite certain we've all had customers who, have, who never paid or clients not paying. You know, or the fact that your business has rapidly grown or the costs that are associated with that rise, how are you going to manage those type of things? You know, other areas could be staffing, you know, especially with industrial relation issues. How are you going to manage um, we'll call it union intervention? You know, they may pull a strike against you. It's got nothing to do with your organisation. It's got nothing to do with the industry, but they've gone out in sympathy with another union. How are you going to manage those things? Human error, that, that's pretty much very simple to explain. But then we've got conflict management. So basically that could be the fact that you've got workers who just don't get along with each other, but, or just don't get along with you, or just, uh, just not are the right fit for the organisation. Or at times when the economy is at a big boom, how do you make sure you get the correct vacancies that are filled with the right people? Not just any person, but the right people. Other issues could be as suppliers. You know, basically, you know, you get a good downpour up here during the wet season. You know, the roads are cut off, freight can't come through. So suddenly now it's, oh no, it, it's, it's an accepted norm. It, it shouldn't be. How are you going to get around those things? Or other interruptions to your supply chain? So basically, or if you're uh, manufacturing something, where are your raw products coming from? Maybe there will be a, an international dispute in a certain area and that's the only place that supplies your goods. Natural disasters, cyclones, storms, bushfires and drought. Now, as you look at it, it's, that's very big across um, Australia. I mean, we had the bushfires earlier in the year. Um, we get cyclones here in the Northern Territory. There's drought in New South Wales, as well as Queensland. I mean, we had the hurricanes um, in New Orleans in 2008, if I remember correctly, as well as, you know, when we look at technology. I mean, how often do we actually have technical difficulties in making sure that we get things across? You know, um, network failures, hardware failures, problems associated with using um, outdated equipment, very simple things that somehow that, you know, all our lives are now geared around technology, especially after the coronavirus. We're now doing a lot more fate, um, online, hence this actual um, presentation. So when we look at um, business continuity, the Darwin Innovation Hub, instead of having everyone else hanging around their offices here and socialising, we've actually had to go now online and do our presentations this way. Other areas could be um, under the work health safety, incidents caused by materials. So that's the incorrect material for the job, or it could be the equipment, the location of your work, or the distance of clients of you actually, of them coming in to see you, they may not come in or out, or the fact that, you know, I don't want to say it, but it, it just could be when we look at human error before, 
you now get we'll call it a, a regulator intervention. So now the regulator is going to come knocking at your door. How are you going to manage these type of things? So when we look at this type of stuff is what are we actually going to be putting into your plans and how are we actually going to be managing that? So when we look at it, it's more about putting multiple plans together to ensure you've, you're going to manage all areas. So when we start off is you actually want to look at, you know, it's always better to go prevention first rather than recovery. Because when we look at it, you, what you want to do is you want to identify what potentially all of your we'll call it perceived issues could be. Not everyone's going to be having the same ones. So if you're a, a supplier, you're probably not going to be having a lot of we'll call it business to consumer. So you're not going to be worrying about what the actual consumer is. You're going to be more worried about what your seller is going to be. So that's more your business to business. But if you're a seller, it's a bit like in the food industry, you're going to be more geared around the behaviors and the attitudes of your clientele as opposed to um, what you're actually going through that way. Part of that is that when we look at uh, preparedness, you should be doing what they call a business impact analysis. That's once with your overall plan is actually the nuts and bolts of how are you going to be managing that. We'll go a little bit further into that um, later. So that's your nuts and bolts. Response, how are you going to be responding to these incidences? Now, I will keep referring to it in a, a general term because some of these instances may be of benefit later on, and we'll explain those as well. So an incident or a plan, when we look at the health and safety one, I'm probably safe to say majoritively should have a, an emergency management plan, which is you know, in the event that someone hurts themselves, what are you going to do? Now, the other part is, what are you going to do if a supplier goes out of business? How are you going to be managing those type of issues? They may be something you have at the back of your mind, but you may not actually have it on pen and paper. And from that recovery plan, that should also be part tied into your overall strategic plan for your business. So when we look at um, organizational resilience, which is how are you going to bounce back from one of these issues? So basically, when we look at it, we have four categories. We have a decline. So basically, when we look at the COVID situation, is it's all about that you just go, it's too hard, I'm out of here, you cease business, it's just, the business goes belly up. Um, a good good example of that is <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you the dates a little bit later. But in early two thousand, there was a fire in the Phillips manufacturing plant in Albuquerque, and what we're going to be looking at is Ericsson, the mobile phone company. So basically, what happened was there was a fire at the Albuquerque facility in New Mexico in the electronics plant. When that happened, their customer Ericsson didn't spring into action at that moment. Any employees detected this disruption. Ericsson's employees lacked the urgency, mindfulness, and passion to react quickly. They suffered production disruption and lost more than $400 million due to that one issue. And we're gonna talk a lot about this issue later. Basically what happened was Ericsson's competitors grew their market share. Next part we wanna look at is basically it's survival. So basically you're gonna scale back and just keep your head above water. So it's an organization's resilience to exist in a very, very small form of, what, of after what's happened.
So the next part is, is to stabilize, is to get back to where you were beforehand. So when we look at the coronavirus, you want to get back to business as normal. No change, no nothing, almost zero disruption because of this. Um, a good example of that is, is in 2008, Hurricane Katrina and the Mississippi Power Plant's um, response. Following the Hurricane uh, Katrina, the power plant grew from 1,200 staff to 10,000 in just a couple of days. Prior investments in mutual uh, aid agreements with other energy infrastructure providers increased um, the supply level and we're actually able to restore back to we'll call it as norm within 12 days. So that's a huge one in that regards. So they were able to get back to normal at that point there. And the last one is, is thriving. How can you benefit from this? So basically, if there's been a, an issue, a, um, a disruption, how are you gonna bounce back, but not just bounce back, but bounce forward? So basically, you know, with the coronavirus, how can you adapt or change in different ways? Another one is when we talk about the, um, we're gonna talk about the competitor now to the Ericsson phone company. We're gonna talk about Philips, uh, sorry, Nokia. So with that same fire, Nokia actually escalated the issue quite rapidly, kept on conducting situational risk assessments and through extraordinary efforts and intensive collaboration with their suppliers and other suppliers, Nokia managed to manage the event and significantly increase its share in the mobile phone market. They're the ones that actually knocked Ericsson out and we're gonna go quite a lot into that later in that regards because that to me, that's, it is a beautiful um, case study in regards to how do you actually manage organizational resilience? So when we look at this, probably one of the best crisis managers to ever come out with any type of quote is Sir Winston Churchill. And this was came out after World War II when he was addressing the UN, is never let a good crisis go to waste. He's probably one of the very few people that really made sure he just doesn't survive with his head above water or anything else. He was going to go and make all issues into something better for himself and obviously for uh, the United Kingdom at that point in time. So when we look at crisis management, some of the um, areas that we spoke about before is that what we should be looking at is probably one of the ones we can handle very quickly and very easy, especially now um, with the COVID on, there is an abundance now of labor. So when we look at that, is that what we should be looking at is your human resourcing. You know, when you want to step up, do you want to put more people on? Do you want to, to get you back to the norm? Or do you want to put more people on to actually bounce forward? The other part is, is it's now an opportunity to look at um, redeveloping your organization into something um, potentially different. Is it what it was working before? Is it gonna work in the future? There's probably a good chance you're going to have to adapt somehow. So when we actually look at that is some employees may not be the same fit for what you're going to be to what you had before. So that may be something you need to look at as well, is how do you now adapt your business to the current circumstances? Things you really need to think about is you really need to think about these following questions here. So, is your company at a cash flow break even? In other words, 
Are you just keeping your head above water? Are you going backwards? When you look at your new growth initiatives, can you do it with those current staff? Do you need more staff? Do you need better qualified staff? Can you upskill those current staff? Especially when we look at our cash flow, do you have existing cash? Or can you tap into credit lines used for growth? So when you look at that, obviously people are now looking, especially investment companies, as well as banks, are now looking at how industry is now going to push forward. And if they see something good, there's a good chance they'll be more willing to back it than if you just go back to the old norm. Other parts are, do you have or do you know of any alternative suppliers? If you've only got one supplier and they shut down, they've stopped you. You really got to look at other suppliers. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to go use them, but you've got to know where you can get them in a, we'll call it a short amount of time. Especially when people talk about they're having logistics problems, um, especially in remote areas. A good example is uh, in the Northern Territory. Everyone talks about it comes up by road freight. It takes a couple of days. If you needed it yesterday, that's not gonna do you any good. You need to know what your alternative suppliers are and what type of timeframes they have are. The other part is you have a great, not good, but great relationship with your supplier. So when they have an issue, they're more likely going to be um, speaking to you sooner rather than later. Are they, be, are they going to be willing to assist you in any resolutions you need? Another part is, are you going to stick with your old client base or customers? Or can you diversify? Can you spread out further? Right now is probably an awesome time to look at your current product and service offerings. And can you step it up a notch? Is this really what everyone still needs? Can I change it? So, when we look at COVID-19, why is that different? So basically, when we look at it, we had government intervention. So I see these are all different types of disruptions that um, can affect externally to your business, as well as internally. So when we look at it, what happened with COVID-19, we had government intervention. There's a very good chance supplies were disrupted. Logistics were definitely disrupted. We had new laws and legislation. Financial systems became very, very questionable. The client's social norms changed. In other words, we couldn't gather in large groups. Certain people couldn't go off to the pub and have a beer. You know, so we're looking at the whole different way things were done. In fact, actually, when you look at it, the social norms changed considerably when children were stopped going to school. That changed the behavior of the normal household. Many states and territories were restricted in their movements. So basically now, when you look at it straight away, tourism, that shattered completely. Change in population behavior. No one could have ever predicted a toilet paper shortage. That was unforeseen. It was absolutely, I won't say uncalled for, but panic buying. No one predicted that. 
which then obviously also then flowed on to um, hand sanitizer, then it flowed on to pasta, and then it flowed on to, I saw it with flour and eggs and milk. I mean, you know, there were limitations that the supermarkets were putting on this type of things. No one predicted this type of behavior. And the last one is new work environments. So when we look at that, that's now people working from home in what was previously in some areas a service industry or where you actually did a lot of face-to-face, -face, people are now saying, oh, we're gonna be working from home. So now that's the management of people in a, we'll call it a workplace that the employer is now responsible for. How are we gonna manage those type of people? Are they really working or are they just um, on the couch watching Netflix? I mean, we, we really cannot determine how that happened. So, when we look at all those type of issues there, what made COVID different is everything happened at once. You could probably put plans in for a couple of those areas, but what made COVID different is everything happened at once. When you looked at it, we had government intervention, which then fed on to disruption of um, movement which then disrupted supplies which then disrupted logistics on top of that we couldn't um gather so then there was policing laws that are introduced there, there was so much change and unheaval it's almost unheard of in that type of sense but the thing is we now know it can happen we should be preparing for the worst in those type of sense so when you look at it pandemic management should be covering off on all of these type of points there so when we look at this now in regards to how are you going to help yourself out with bouncing back from covid is you should be assessing your current supplier activities we talked before about that your suppliers uh, may have been disrupted or the fact that you should actually have a great relationship with your suppliers not just a good one find out what they're up to identify what your current client activities are going to be like but from that that's going from the norm but now you should be looking at potential new suppliers so therefore you will actually have more than sufficient to keep you running are you going to stick with your old clients or are you going to open up to new areas? So what I want to sort of talk to you about now is when we looked at um, prior was the Ericsson and the Nokia issue is how did they bounce back and or and as well as regards to not bounce back at all. So what it comes down to is that um, approximately 8 p.m. on March the 17th, 2000, a lightning bolt struck a high voltage electricity line in New Mexico. Power fluctuated across the state. A fire broke out in the fabrication line of the Philips Electronics radio frequency chip manufacturing plant in Albuquerque. They did a really great job straight away. Plant personnel reacted quickly, extinguished the fire within 10 minutes. At first look, it was clear that eight trays of silicon wafers that are on line were destroyed. When fully processed, these would have produced chips for several thousand mobile phones. Minor setback, not a major issue. However, at the chip factory, production has taken place in clean rooms. The cleanest of the facilities have no more than one one speck of dust per cubic foot. Stated differently, these facilities are 10,000 times cleaner than hospital operating rooms. There's our problem now. Fire produces smoke, triggers sprinklers. Fire and smoke take lives, sprinklers save them. They do the right job, but fire, smoke, water, not good for the chips. As they dug deeper into the investigation, plant personnel found out the smoke 
and the water contaminated millions of chips that have been stored for shipment. This damage was so extensive, it was now an issue. 5,000 kilometers away, at a Nokia plant outside Helsinki, the production planner who was following the well-articulated process for managing the chips inflow from Philips failed to get the routine input he needed. So straight away, his logistics were disrupted. The failure could have well have been you know, out of the norm. Even so, he informed the plant's purchasing manager and then again followed up an established process which they passed on to their purchasing manager, which then contacted Albuquerque. So first of all, the Phillips engineers, this is now in Albuquerque, the managers grappled with the aftermath and they realized the cleanup would take about a week, less than a week, which meant that the customers would be affected, well, at least temporarily. So Nokia and its arch rival Ericsson were approximately 45 to 50% of the plant's shipments. Philips managed to decide that their orders will be filled first when the plant returned to normal. So you can start to see now that the relationship between Philips and Nokia was strong enough they were able to say, fulfill our orders first. On March 20th, Philips called his customers stating that Philips had disruption which lasted about a week. However, there was a good culture within Nokia that encouraged discussing possible problems openly and he informed his boss and basically they started checking where the other parts of the plants of, of the phone were made in New Mexico instead of and they're able to source what they needed in one day rather than having to wait that week. So basically they were on, on the mark straight away. However, only a few hundred kilometers away at Ericsson, they got the call from Philips as well. Until this, Ericsson's planners, managers had not sensed any discrepancy in their performance, they didn't care. Such as management had no reason to disbelieve Phillips's explanation that it was only going to take a week. They certainly didn't perceive the concern or step up any action at all. So this is now the inaction. Nokia intensified its tracking communications with Phillips. And Nokia, oh sorry, and Phillips was actually happy for their intervention to actually assist in this. So after two weeks after the fire, Phillips admitted it needed even more time to fix. So now it's two weeks later. Recognizing Phillips's problem could affect the production of seven million phones, Nokia took three steps. They, their leadership focused on Phillips and monitoring their actions. They were involved with the client. A team of exec, uh, sorry, and a second group redesigned some of the chips so they could be produced in other Philips and non Philips plants where appropriate. And a third group looked for alternative manufacturers. So they looked at everything. So two weeks later, at the end of March, Ericsson finally came to appreciate the fullness of the problem. However, for reasons which one may speculate, still didn't act speedily enough. And they didn't get involved till early April. By then, Ericsson had very few options left. So Nokia then basically increased its profit from 42% and took over a global share of 30%. So in the end, Ericsson identified that the fire and lack of jumping in cost them $2 million, sorry, $200 million in his mobile phone division, which then um, decreased their total annual earnings of lower than 33 uh, 333 million. 
Six months later, annual loss of 1.68 billion. And then it announced outsourcing of the manufacturing to a Flextronics area. And the Flectronics took over Ericsson's plants. And then in 2001, signed a memorandum of understanding to create Sony Ericsson. So basically, Ericsson was bought out completely. And that was all because of a 10 minute fire. So that's what you can really look at is how are you gonna bounce back and if not bounce forward. So when we look at our COVID, what are we gonna look at is your current suppliers. You should be looking at your client activities, but also we already have a very good roadmap released to us. So when we look at this, the Northern Territory has released the road to recovery, as well as they've actually introduced their stage two plans, which is for the 5th of May, which they've done. They are extremely easy to follow. You go online, you fill them in, and as long as you abide by them, it's very easy. Um, the Chief Minister identified that it's, you fill it in, you work. You don't have to wait for them. It is a very, very easy to use, and easy to follow system. Now, I'm saying that though, there are other areas you're gonna look at as well, is that when we look at remote and essential workers, they are currently still allowed to go out there at the moment. However, you should be having a plan on how you're going to manage them out there. All in all, it is like a, a safety management plan, but you've got to put down in regards to what are they going to do in distancing, social distancing prior to travel, what's going to be happening during the travel and operational activities, cleaning of vehicles, workplace physical distancing, hand sanitization, and where a meal is going to be sourced from, fuel and maintenance of the vehicles, health of the individuals. You definitely must have record keeping. And there must be a staff declaration of those who are going to be heading out into those remote areas. So in summarizing a lot of those issues there, business continuity is not just about the pandemic we're going through and coming out of. It is the survivability of your business in regards to any we'll call it hiccup, any issue that prohibits you from acting or operating as normal. But however, remember it, the four phases, there's decline. Are you going to try and ride it out? I'm oh, sorry, are you going to just close your door and walk away? Are you just going to try and ride it out and keep your head above water? Are you going to try and get back to the norm? Or are you going to try and take a bigger market share than what you originally had? So with that, you should be having your business management plan, which then should have you identified of your business impact analysis, the risk assessment of those areas, the incident response plan, and a recovery plan. So these are some of the areas you can actually look at. So you've got the coronavirus NT, steps to re restart businesses. Safe Work Australia has some good information on there as well. And there is an Australian standard, 50-50, uh, which is business continuity managing disruption related risk. So I'll have to say thank you very much. And thank back you, to you very much, Martin. Um, one thing that was really highlighted to me is the importance of them to not be so reliant on a limited number of suppliers and to broaden our supply chains. Um, another thing that was highlighted is in relation to that Winston Churchill quote that it is now the best time to reevaluate and revalidate our products and services with our customers, reach out to them personally, and understand what changes they want to see or need to see. Business has changed now, but so too have consumer needs. So take the time now while you can to reach out and make sure that when you do open, that you are still relevant in the marketplace. We've been gifted a great opportunity of time right now 
to sit back and reassess our businesses. So as Winston said, don't let it go to waste. Um, doesn't look like we have any questions at the moment. So thank you, Martin, for your insights in today into business continuity. And we will speak to you soon. No worries. Thank you very much. Thank you.